do not adjust your podcast player. That is a football crowd. To be specific, it's the famed cop stand at Liverpool Football Club's Anfield Stadium. And that's because today's guest is Tony Padilla. Now, viewers of Number File videos will know Tony as the guy who does all the episodes about the really big numbers. Things like Tree 3, Rayo's number, Graham's number, that sort of thing. Tony's day job is a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Nottingham. But as a man born and bred in Liverpool, his true passion is the Reds, Liverpool Football Club, the famous soccer team for those of you in the US. Tony's a season ticket holder and travels to most of Liverpool's home games. That's a good two and a half hours drive from his house in Nottingham. And look, while I'm not in Tony's league, I'm also a Liverpool fan and have long wanted to go to a game with him. So for today's episode, we recorded in the car. Sorry about the noise. We're travelling to Anfield to watch Liverpool's Premier League game against Watford. So let me get you on the record. What's your score prediction today? Oh, I don't like to predict, to be perfectly honest. I know Watford, isn't it? It's, uh, let's say, 4-0. 4-0. Yeah. 4-0 to Liverpool. Yeah. All right. I've known you a long time now, and I know what a huge Liverpool fan you are. I'm really curious to see what it'll be like next to you during a game. Like, do you lose the plot a bit? Are you, do you get a bit over-emotional, or are you, like, pretty calm? And No, the former, definitely. I'll lose the plot if the referee starts playing up. I'll... Uh... I'll be singing me songs and we've got to sing our songs today, Brady, right? Because Jürgen Klopp said we have to, right? So, okay. So it's, you know, that's the rule. So, yeah, well, I'll be singing away and getting angry if, if it goes that way, but hopefully it won't go that way. We'll see. What were you like as a kid, like, when you were five, ten? Were you, like, physics, maths nerd kid? Or were you football kid? Or, like, what were you? I was both. To be honest, I used to like drawing as well, but footy dominated me life, right? I mean, it always has since I was about seven, probably. Obviously, being you know growing up in the Liverpool area, my dad used to serve the players their, their pre-match meal in the restaurant he worked in, so we had that connection as well. So he knew he knew some of the players and stuff, and I always loved maths as well. I always loved numbers, and uh, I, I always I always remember me first sum I got wrong, which was when I was in in reception class, it was five plus zero. None of us had ever seen a zero before. It was a, you know, a number we'd never seen. It was like, because you're a Liverpool fan. So. Yeah, none of us had ever seen the zero. And, uh, and it was like, so we were all debating what to put. And it's like, we were only like five at a time. And I remember uh, it all came down. Even then, it was sort of, you know, I was the one that had to make the call. And uh, we put six. And obviously it was wrong. So, you know, I've always loved footy and always loved maths. And uh, yeah, so it's... It's a strange combination in some ways, you know, some might say, but um, yeah, it's always been, both of them have been a big part of my life. I want to hear the reasoning as to why five plus zero equals six. <laughs> I didn't know what zero was, Brady. You know, you know <laughs> it, it was just this new thing that I'd never come across before. We take it so for granted now what zero is, but this is this brand new phenomenon. The teacher just, just like sort of threw it at us like, what is this? So I said, oh, it must be six. Uh, I don't know. It was, yeah, not great reasoning, but... Uh, <laughs> First question I ever got wrong. It's always stuck in my mind. My kids think it's hilarious. They think I was so stupid for putting that answer. Like, so, uh, but yeah. So if I got in a time machine and went back to that young Tony and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would he have said to me? Oh, then, I don't know, probably Batman or something then. I, say, I remember I got Batman uh, <laughs> sort of outfit for my birthday that year. I know within a few years, it was definitely professional footballer. By the time I was seven or eight, I wanted to be a professional footballer. And then, I used to play goal, by the way. Right. Um, by the time I was about 12, I, I realised that that dream was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to plan B, which which was actually to be an academic. That's, that's, that, that was my we plan. Yeah, right. What type that, of a physicist or? Mathematician, really, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, maths was always my, my favourite subject. I don't think I necessarily knew what a physicist was at that stage, uh, I would say. But certainly, yeah, it was, I would say, mathematician. But just to work in a university, I think I saw some documentary about Cambridge University. Although my mum and dad were watching something on the telly. I thought, well, that place looks nice. And we were talking about it and I said, yeah, you can work there one day. Why was mathematics your favourite subject? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, just the, the sort of joy of numbers, seeing the combinations put together, just seeing how it all worked and just the, the patterns that, that emerged. And there's a definite beauty to it. I think, I think it was just that, really. It was just sort of seeing the, the combinations, the purity of it. And I think that still resonates with me today. There's nothing more beautiful than when you do a complex calculation and you get out 
a simple answer, something that's really small and elegant, and, you know, like a two or something like that. It's just something like, it's just like, wow, all these combinations that came together and yet it comes out as two. And I think there's, you know, only math can give you that kind of purity, that, that beauty, and I've, I've always loved that. Surely at that point you were a long way from understanding things like proof and some of the more beautiful applications of mathematics. Yeah, I, yeah, that's true. I mean, um, obviously, it was just playing with sort of combinations of numbers. And I remember one, I, I talk about this in my book actually, about uh, just the silly things like looking up big numbers in the in a dictionary, right? You know, I sort of got to give this dictionary for Christmas, so I just thought, I'm going to look up big numbers. And then and there was like, you know, a million, a billion. And then you start seeing the patterns of trillion. You start seeing there's this link to Latin. So you start figuring out, you know, oh, a centillion's in there, you know, and all these sorts of, these combinations. You see, and and, and that's, I even got a kick out of that at that stage. But yeah, obviously proof wasn't really something that, that you know, you really started to develop until I was in sixth form, which is when you're sort of 17, 18, right? And then, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I don't know if you want to talk about that later stage, but, but by that stage, it was um, the sort of pure maths wasn't something that I really enjoyed as much as more of the applied stuff. And that's probably why I became a physicist. What did your mum and dad do? Did you have mathy influence or like, were you in a family or an environment that really cultured those interests? I mean, they, they were into education, but there was not, not especially maths. I mean, um, so my dad, as I've mentioned, he, he's uh, always waited in restaurants his whole life. He was smart at maths at school. He, he won um, a maths prize at school, but he had to leave school when he was 14 because basically his, his family uh, needed him to go out and work. He, he grew up in Spain just after the Spanish Civil War. So whilst he was good at maths, he, he never had the chance really to sort of, you know, allow it to blossom. And my mom, she was, she was a teacher, but she was a language teacher. She taught Spanish and French. And so, so yeah, not, not, not especially mathematical, although again, she was good at maths at school, you know, just, but it just wasn't the direction that, that she took. But very much, you know, supported education and all that. That was definitely the case. I remember my mum marching into school one day because she, I was getting a bit bored with, with some of the maths that was getting taught. And, and uh, she demanded that the teacher give me some, uh, something a bit more challenging. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure it ever happened, but she, she certainly took that on, that, that fight on on my behalf. I wanted to ask about your cultural background because you sound like a Scouser and obviously you, obviously you love Liverpool Football Club, but you have got this uh, Italian name. What, what's your background? Well, it's a Spanish name. It's, um, yeah, I mean, so, so my dad comes from the north of Spain, a city called uh, Santander, and my mum's a Scouser. She grew up in Bootle, just on the outskirts of Liverpool. And uh, yeah, so, so he used to work on, on one of these cruise ships that used to, we used to sail all around South America, but he used to go up into, into Europe and, and it docked at Liverpool. That was during the time of swinging 60s and, and you know, the Beatles were, were sort of all doing their thing in Liverpool. And he, uh, yeah, so he, when it came to shore, and that's where he met me mom in a club called the Jacaranda in Liverpool, which is uh, where the Beatles used to play. And then they obviously met. My mum was, was always, Loves, loves everything to do with Spain, right? So, uh, yeah, so, so that's how it all started. So that's the background, yeah. What do you identify as? I mean, yeah, I mean, I identify as a Scouser. Like, Scouser's not English, of course, right? So, I mean, I do have a sort of, you know, a soft spot for Spain, as, as, as inevitably would, right? I mean, I still have family there. I have cousins over there, you know, so all, all, all still in Santander, one in Madrid. It's definitely sort of an important part of, of, of who I am. I definitely relate to Spain and that's part of me. Do you speak Spanish? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not perfect, but it's... Give us a sample. Yeah, hablo bastante bien el español, no? Bueno. <laughs> I've got no idea. So I, I speak quite well. I speak Spanish quite well. Okay, <laughs> right. Progressing through high school, were you the best at maths in the class? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Although I did get beaten once, I remember this. It was... Uh, it was there was one year, maybe it was the second second year in high school, and obviously I, I was always, usually came top, and but this one year I didn't, and um, I think I came third or fourth, and I had just some silly mistake. Was there a zero? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's probably five for a zero. I probably just couldn't get out of my head, but I remember bumping into one of the girls. There's a there's a girl that came top, and I bumped into her like a, I think it was a family events or something. And she was still going on about it. I was like, hey, seriously, still going on about that? <laughs> so you're going through high school, university's approaching. 
what are you what are you thinking what are your thoughts where are you heading yeah so it's all going back to that sort of random documentary that i'd seen i decided that i wanted to go to cambridge to do maths i decided that quite as i said quite early probably by the time i was about 14 but you know not many people from my school had had gone to cambridge in fact i don't think anybody had i think we'd had one or two go to oxford but not many yeah and it's certainly it wasn't great for maths either in my school it was it wasn't really one of the subjects that it, it wasn't great. I was having mum had gone in and, and, and sort of had a little moan and stuff like that. And I really wanted to do it. Um, it, was, it was definitely the subject that, that, was, that where my heart was set. My brother, he'd sort of also enjoyed doing maths, but he'd um, gone to do engineering. And I think he regretted it. And that sort of helped formulate my opinion, right? You know, he'd made that decision because he thought, you know, it was more about getting a job and all that. And, and, then, and he always said, you know, you need to just do, I mean, mum said this as well, you know, just do what you enjoy. And that was maths, so that that was you know the, the, the what influenced that decision. Mm. Um, and it was definitely the right decision. But I, I knew I was going to have to leave my school if I was going to do this, so I went to a sixth form college. So for people like in America and stuff, is that kind of like a bit like posher or more advanced? It wasn't posher. I mean, in the sense that it was still like you know part of the state system, and you didn't pay or anything to go. It was just bigger, and it had more sort of specialism and all that, and it was just there. Uh, I knew that this sixth form I was going to go to would just would, was going to be better for doing for doing maths. One of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to do it, it, you could do maths and you could do further maths, and I knew I definitely wanted to do both. And my school had said, "Well, you can do further maths, but you're going to have to do it on your own and in, in your spare time, basically, and we'll try to help you through it." Mm. And I just thought that just doesn't sound much much fun. Like you want to bounce the ideas off people and that sort of thing. So I knew I had to go somewhere where there was more people doing it and that's that, that influenced it so I, so I up sticks and I went to Sixth Form College I mean it wasn't particularly far away but it was in a different place so. so you did mathematics at Cambridge did you yep yeah tell me about that then because the Tony I know now is a physicist I know you love mathematics still but you're a physicist tell me how you, you went from doing mathematics at Cambridge to being a physicist now yeah, so this is this is another another zero story actually, Brady. So it's, uh, I hope you're not jinxing the game today. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's, it's like a, that was kind of like a transition point. So you, you mentioned earlier about proofs and all that, and, you know, and that's all great. And and as I said I always loved numbers, always loved you know the ideas of numbers and combinations of numbers and all that sort of stuff. But obviously, the first time I really sort of started doing what, what it really is pure mathematics. Uh, was at university. We had some coursework uh, to do. I'd, I'd, I'd done the coursework fine. I, 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 you know, it, was, it was one of the earliest ones I did, and I'm pretty much sure that it had gone okay. I handed it in, and I was going to get the marks back. And I went to this meeting to get the you know, tutorial type thing to get the marks back. And I looked at this sheet, you know, of the, you know, with my marks on it, and there was a big fat zero on it. And I was like, what? I was like, what have I done wrong here? I was convinced I'd done the proof right. So I was stunned. So I was like, what's gone wrong here? And he said, well, there's nothing wrong with, with your proof. This was, you know, this Cambridge professor was saying to me, there's nothing wrong with your actual proof. Proof is correct. I was like, all right, well, why'd you give me zero then? You know what I mean? And he was like, well, because I don't like how you've laid it out on the piece of paper. So he, he didn't like that I'd put, so when you're doing a proof, right, you have a statement followed by another statement followed by another statement, you know, like sort of things that, arguments that one follows from another like and uh, you know they're, they're connected in, in some logical connection so yeah. you normally have your first statement you know and then there's a little arrow like a sort of implied sign and then another statement so what i'd done was i i, I had these logical statements and I'd, I'd put all these so i had a statement on one line and then in the margin i'd put the arrow and then next statement and then margin arrow next statement like that and he's like well he goes well what, what are, what's before these arrows I said, what do you mean, what's before the arrows, the line above? He goes, no, 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 what's before the arrows? So the, the, the line above, and he's like, nah, it goes off the paper, there's nothing there. So I was like, well, you are joking me, right? That's ridiculous. So, I mean, I didn't say that to him, but I yeah. thought it bad. And then- um, No, no, that is ridiculous to give you a zero. Yeah, totally, but I, I kind of think I know what he was doing. Right? He was trying to sort of instill in me a kind of rigor. He was, he was trying to make a point, right? Mm -hmm. And instill in me a, a kind of rigor in how I should approach maths. And that's all fine. I suppose I sort of get that now, but I think at the time it sort of triggered something in me where I thought, well, you know what? That's annoying. And I need me, me sort of numbers in my maths to be a little bit, 
it needs to come alive a bit more it needs to have something extra it needs to have a little bit of extra personality and i think i found that in in physics and obviously you started doing things that were applied applied maths you know things like quantum mechanics that, that were connected to physics and that's sort of the direction i took as you started to specialize as things went on how did you find physics from the maths department? What was your gateway drug to physics? I mean, we had quantum mechanics courses and, and, and mechanics courses, and things like that. You know, they were part of it. You, you could take them as options and the mathematical physics courses as well, right? So it was all in there and the sort of, in Cambridge, the, it, one of the things, I, I could have ended up working in a maths department or a physics department. It just depends how the balance, where the balance is in, 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 a, in the various places. If I was working in, in Cambridge, I'd, I'd, pre, I'd be in the maths department. I'd be in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. But it just so happens that in Nottingham, the stuff that I do was, was the home was in the, in the physics department. So I kind of sit on that border of the two subjects. So the physics you do now is more mathematical than typical physics? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I'm a theoretical physicist, so it's all about, you know, working with equations and formulas to describe, in my case, you know, the universe and, and how it's evolving. How would you describe your physics then? Because, you know, you're a theoretical physicist. If you're talking to someone in the pub or in the cop today and they ask about your job, what do you tell them? Well, did I ever tell you what, what happened when I registered my daughter's birth? But when you, when you go to register for a birth, like, you have to give loads of details, obviously, including your occupation. And I went, to, I went to register this birth, and it was like, I put occupation theoretical physicist. And uh, the woman, the woman the, the, that I was having the, the form over to, she goes, occupation theoretical physicist. She starts laughing. I said, what, what are you laughing for? She goes, oh, sometimes people put astronaut. I am a theoretical physicist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, I don't know. It's, it, it, people always seem to think you're an astrophysicist. I'm definitely not an astrophysicist. That seems to be the sort of go-to place when they try to do, uh, get their head around what, what you do. But, yeah, I mean, what do I do? I, 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 I play with, with models and equations. Models of what? The universe, how it evolves, how, how the universe is, is, uh, is growing, essentially, how it's, how it's developing, how, how it's expanding into the future, that, that's kind of the, the area in which I, I like to work. Because when you tell me you do models of the universe, like there are different ways someone could take that. Some people could think you're trying to figure out how the rings form around Saturn. Right. And other people will think, you know, you're dealing with the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe and there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. How galaxies form, what black holes do, like where, where are you sitting in all the different things that happen in the universe? Yeah, so, so I mean, you probably have to say on the largest scales, because I would probably primarily be a cosmologist, but of course you can't ignore the physics on smaller scales as well. You, you basically, so, so the kind of the main thing that I'm interested in is understanding um, that things like the nature of dark energy, which is that you know that the universe is is expanding, and but not only is that expansion sort of, you know, not only is it happening, not, not only is the space between galaxies getting bigger, well actually it's getting bigger faster, you know, it's accelerating, and that's completely counterintuitive because you think gravity is an attractive force, right? So you think that actually, okay, the universe can expand, but it should be slowing down the expansion, but that's not what's happening, it's going faster. And so there's this, why is that happening? Well, people talk about this stuff, dark energy, but nobody really knows what, what it is microscopically, right? And that's sort of one of the questions that I'd be interested in. Can you, so you're talking there, you're talking about microscopics, but you're also trying to apply it on the larger scale of the universe, right? So it's kind of both in some respects. But how can Tony, the guy living in Nottingham, do that? You haven't got a telescope, you haven't got a particle collider, you haven't got machines. Do you just sit in the bath and think, hmm, maybe this is what's happening, and then do some sums to figure out if it's possible. I don't do baths, I never do showers. But <laughs> uh, I mean, it's maths, isn't it, really? That's what you use, you use the tool of mathematics, that's what it is. That's the trick, you have a whiteboard in my sort of study at home, uh, I've obviously got two in my office, and use maths, the, you know, the language of maths to try to describe the universe. You, you realize what's needed, you understand the underlying physics of, of what can go wrong and you put it all together and you try to build a model that actually actually makes sense which is which extends the, the existing models which maybe are falling down at various points so for example things like Einstein's uh, general relativity we know is an amazing theory which which describes the universe on, on a variety of scales right it can certainly describe sort of planetary motion around the sun for example and, and, and even in more extreme environments but what it doesn't do is without this dark energy it's not able to describe the evolution of the universe. You've got to put in this mysterious substance, which we don't know what it is. See, you, you take something brilliant like Einstein's theory as your sort of base point, you try to build around it and move, you know, 
science in a lot of respects is, is very incremental. People sort of think it's all about these massive epiphanies, but it's, it, it's, it never really is. It, it's, it, it's incremental. Even, even those what seem like great epiphanies of the past, like you know the relativity breakthroughs into relativity and quantum mechanics, they were to an extent, to some extent, there was a lot of increments that went in before that led to those, those sudden epiphanies. And that's what it is. You're sort of trying to build slowly, slowly outwards of what is, what is known in a sensible way. And Einstein's theory is a classic example of something that is so good. It's so good. And it's so fundamental that actually, if you try to screw around with it, which is one of the things that I do do, I, that, that, yeah, I, I try to play with gravity and modify gravity and the model of gravity, it almost always falls off a cliff straight away. So you can cook up some, say, suppose you want to describe the expansion of the universe, the acceleration of the universe using some alternative theory of gravity rather than some mysterious fluid, which we don't know what it is, then you can do that. It's quite easy to do that. But things rapidly go wrong elsewhere and the, and the theory will, will, will fall over in some other regime or for some other reason. Maybe it, quantum mechanically it can never make sense or, or maybe it, 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 will, it will screw up the physics in and around the solar system. You don't get the right predictions there. There's loads of things that can go wrong and this is the game that you play. You try to push the boundary and see it, do things fall over elsewhere. You're really passionate about physics. I can always tell that when I speak to you. You're really passionate about football. Liverpool, I can tell that when I speak to you. Which is your true love? I think you know the answer to that. I think we're on our way to it now. <laughs> Would you rather win the Nobel Prize in physics or play for Liverpool? I'd rather play for Liverpool. Yeah. I would, yeah. One game for Liverpool over a Nobel Prize in physics? I mean, it would just be a... Yeah, I think so. I, I uh, that's not fair. I don't like that. Can I not have both? No, of course you can't. That's the whole point of the question. Yeah, but Neil's bore. He played football, didn't he? And then he... Uh, Addy also... <laughs> Addy, Addy would have Nobel Prize, so... Uh... What would you take? A Nobel Prize in physics or a first-team cap for Liverpool? Normally, I would have to up the Okay, 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 right, okay. There's no, there's no, this isn't a trick question, it's, a, it's, a, it's binary. So I'll play one game for Liverpool? Yeah, first team game for Liverpool. One game, at the, at the moment. And my Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. how good is it? It's it, for cracking whatever your dream problem to crack is. I mean, I, I guess what I'm getting at is it like a legendary Nobel Prize, like, I don't know, like, you know, with these legends of physics of the past, or is it just one of these? Not to, not to belittle them, but one of these that's sort of, you know, no, it's more on the road. No, it's unification level. So, it's, so, so my top, name's going down in history as, as, a, as, as yep. one of the greatest physicists yep. ever. Yep. Or one game for Liverpool. Or one game for Liverpool. Yeah. Although I don't like, okay, I, greatest physicist, one of the greatest physicists, okay, I'll go for the, I'll go for the groundbreaking Nobel Prize, but if you ask me, am I going to be a, a European Cup winning captain for Liverpool, I'm going for that. Okay, <laughs> well, but you, you're, you're preempting the next level, because the next level was the top tier physicist of all time, Einstein level, or hat-trick for Liverpool in a European Cup. Oh, God, the hat-trick for Liverpool in the European Cup final. Oh. No doubt about it. That okay. would be incredible. OK. <laughs> I would just love myself. <laughs> a lot of people who watch these videos and listen to these podcasts are real science and math nerds, and a lot of them have never really bonded with sport the way you have. Help them understand how football can mean so much to you. And oh, yet, you, but, but also physics does, so you're, you are like them still. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know, it's more than just the game. It's more than just the game. It's, it's a sense of sort of cultural belonging as well, I think. Particularly growing up where I did, you know, in Liverpool, in the you know, Liverpool area, it's, you just can't not really be into football. I suppose some people aren't, but, but you know, it was, it, everyone talks about football. Football's massive, right? And it's just, it just becomes culturally part of who you are. And of course, being a Liverpool fan as well, it's like, there's a load that goes with that, you know. Obviously, there's been the tragedies of, of Heysel and then Hillsborough, and that just sort of builds right into it. And that sense of, particularly with Hillsborough, that sense of sort of you know injustice that went with it, and and you just really become part of it. And it's uh, it, 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 it it's so core to sort of who you are. I think it's it's not really. I mean, it is about the spot. I love watching football, but it's it's also a huge sense of identity I think um, that it brings and I think I think that's that's what it is and you can never lose that it's just once once that once that's set in it's it's it's, it's really you're never gonna, it's never going to go away I think one of the things I always find a great contradiction about you is when I talk to you about football in Liverpool I find you to be 
highly irrational. Right? <laughs> like, like you know, your dislike for Everton, Liverpool's great rivals, your kind of one-eyed belief that Liverpool will conquer at all times, even if it's got past the point where they can. You're a typical one-eyed sports fan who doesn't really see reason. And you kind of almost acknowledge some of, some of it as well there in that it's all about identity and culture. And, and yet you do this occupation that is so much about being hyper-rational. You don't think a physicist is the sort of person who would put much stock in, you know, oh, I need to belong as a human and support the same football team as all the people I grew up next door to. That seems like almost a kind of very simple animal behaviour, isn't it? Like, yeah, you know. I know what you mean. So I've never quite been able to reconcile that kind of hyper-rationalness of all the mathematics and the physics that means so much to you and the kind of one-eyedness about your Liverpool fan. And I've never been able to tell whether or not you're doing the whole Liverpool thing with a bit of a wink and like, yeah, I know it's silly, really, but I play the game. Or you really believe it. I can't tell. <laughs> so firstly, I think there, there's probably more tribalism within physics than, than, than uh, you give credit for. I don't, I don't think I'm particularly guilty of it, but it definitely exists. You only have to look at the sort of whole string theory versus loop quantum gravity sort of thing that goes on which which is really tribalistic and, and not always helpful i mean i've always said I, I fall on the stringy camp but the nature of that whole discussion and debate is not always particularly pleasant but also i think you've also got to be a little bit crazy to be a sort of creative you know physicist haven't you i think i think that that's kind of a necessary so there's a bit of that as well uh, but yeah of course you do have to apply rigor to what you're doing which brings us back to the yeah. the sort of pedantry we talked about earlier i think i get very defensive about about liverpool so i i just don't want anybody to sort of shoot them down and i, I will fight their corner as for as much as it needs and i think i think that that's what it is really well, that's a very scouse trait isn't it <laughs> yeah tell me about doing number file because that's how a lot of people listening to this will know you yeah how have you found that experience Oh, I've loved it. Well, and 60 Civils as well, obviously. It's been quite a journey. I've really enjoyed it. I've always really enjoyed it. Um, but it's been quite a journey. I don't know if you remember our first ever um, first ever video I did. It wasn't for Number Files, it was for 60 Symbols. Do you remember it? It was the Jabulani video, right? And oh, it, the football, yes. Yeah, and I was terrible. Right, so what happened was, you, you, were, you got a load of us. So Jabulani was this football, wasn't it? They had to mm. be, I think it was 2010. Well, it was called. a brand of football, and you were talking about the physics of the way this ball moved through the yeah. air, because it was a big story. And you got a load of us to do a penalty shootout in lab coats, right? Yes. And no one would go in goal, right? And I said, well, I'll go in goal, because I used to play in goal. But I had a bad back at the time, mm. and I was ter- I was rubbish. I don't know if you remember that. I was I've, got, I've got the video. You conceded a lot of goals. <laughs> I wasn't very good. And I, I just kept falling in a heap. I mean, back I was in all sorts of pain. And then, of course, I, I wasn't sort of used to viewer comments. And, of course, everybody was commenting on my rubbish goalkeeper performance. And I was getting all upset about it. I remember my nephew started defending me. And he was only a kid at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> online. And then, you don't know him and all this sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, that was very, but, so that was quite a bit of a baptism of fire. But I'd been desperate to sort of do one of those videos. because I was. You, you know there's a new football. It was released yesterday for the next World Cup. Oh, is it? There's a new ball. Uh, ah, right. No, I'd seen that. Okay, yeah. we'll have to do another one. It cost nearly it. £100, so we'll have to go halves. All right, OK. Yeah, fair enough. I'll keep it, though. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then, and then so that was obviously a bit of a baptism of fire. And, you know, then obviously got a bit more used to things after that. But, so, uh, so you've done a lot of physics videos of the 60 symbols, of course, but also you, you've moved over to number file as well as a favour to me and you seem to have taken on the mantle of the big number guy you've done Graham's number yeah. and Tree 3 and Rayo's that's become kind of one of your niches on number file do you like the big numbers there? So, so firstly I mean I feel more at home at number file and I think the reason is it comes back to that sort of mathematical background really that you know I'd always preferred maths I'd done maths at school and it's almost just by accident almost now that I'm in a physics department. So I, th- I think I was always more at home in, with number file. Whilst I still love 60 symbols, obviously, but the number file is a natural home. But uh, yeah, the big numbers, what I loved about the big numbers or what, you know, is, is the, it goes back to that looking in the dictionary and just looking at, you know, like looking off a centillion or something and just thinking, wow, that's so crazy. And then um, one of the things I've always liked to do is to try to sort of put that maths in, 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 in the, the, the concept of this big number in a physics context to sort of try and bring it alive with physics, which I think is what we've always tried to do, like with things like Graham's number and the whole your head collapsed into what form a black hole and you know, that, that that's always I think that's when you really can get a, a cool feel for how 
ridiculous some of these numbers are when you try to sort of squeeze them into the physical world, which is which I think is is what, what I've always tried to do with them. Uh, and black holes always give you the opportunity to talk about things like that. A quick break to tell you this episode has been sponsored by G Research, a world-leading quantitative finance research firm based in Europe. They're always hiring clever people from around the world to tackle the biggest questions in finance, applying the latest in like machine learning, big data, all that sort of technology. G Research is always looking to hire top STEM talent. So if you're good with numbers, mathematics, that kind of thing, maybe this could be the opportunity you've been looking for. G Research take real pride in the culture they've created. They're keen to nurture future talent. To find out more about them, go to gresearch.co.uk slash number file. Now, as we go back to the episode, a reminder, another video Tony made on number file was about the sum of all the integers, one plus two plus three plus four, etc., all the way to infinity, whatever that means. You can't go to infinity. What is that infinite sum? Well, one way to look at it gives you the answer of minus a twelfth. It's a video many people have watched and commented on on number file. Tony's very familiar with the comments. Let's hear what he has to say. A lot of people love that video. A lot of people, it's their favorite ever number file video. A lot of people really dislike that video and have given you a lot of grief about it. Yeah. How do you reflect on it these days? So I'm glad we made it. I think this sort of the results I think is true. Infinities and and infinite sums are something which is so counterintuitive that I think people make very strong statements which are just not really valid in the physical realm, you know, and it, to be honest, if it's good enough for, for Ramanujan, you know, it's good enough for me. I mean, you know, what we did was in that video, we presented it in a way which I've sort of shown you before, Brady, you can, every single procedure that we carried out can be mapped by this analytic continuation, this mathematical procedure to something that's entirely valid. Taken out of context, I can see why it's upset people. That's, I think, the one nod to that, I would say. But I would say that, you know, the result is correct. As I said, every single step we took can be mapped by analytic continuation to something which would be indisputably correct. And the result is true. It is. And the problem I think that often intuitively people have with it is they want to think of it of infinite sums as a limit of a finite sum. And of course, in some sense, that's, that's always what you do. You, you, you just take, I take the first billion terms and I see what I get. And then I take the first trillion terms and I see what I get. Add them all together, see what I get. And then I, I hope to zoom in on an answer. Now, of course, with something like, like the sum of the, of the integer, of the natural numbers, that, that, that process doesn't work. It just fails, right? So you need to try to get to that infinite sum or infinite series in, in, in a different way. And actually, th there are many different ways in which you can uh, sum an infinite series. And some of them give sensible answers. And, and, and if they do, that, that's the answer, right? But many of them don't. And in case of just taking the, the, the first loads of uh, terms in the sum and seeing where it sort of converges to, that doesn't work for this particular sum. But what about people who say it's diverging? It blows up. But if I take Ramanujan's summation method, which is different, I will get a finite answer. And the answer I get is minus a tab, right? And this is where the physicist in you comes in, right? You know, there are things called like something called the Casimir energy, which involves, which you can calculate using an, a, a similar infinite sums, which you would think diverge. And I think in that case, it's the sum of the cubes. The memory serves it, that comes to one over 120, right? And, you know, these, you, you would apply all the same arguments. That's ridiculous. How could it be one, one over 120? But, you know, the Casimir, uh, this has a direct relation to something called the Casimir energy, which is something we've measured, or we've measured the Casimir force. So this has a link to real physics and real measurements, right? And also, if you think about, if you start thinking about string theory, one of the things you can do is you can sum up, you can look at this, this spectrum of states of, the, of, a, of a vibrating string, the kind of particles that it would predict. And that involves summing up all the different modes of vibration of, of, a, of a fundamental string. That's the sum of the integers that, that come, the sum of the natural numbers that comes in there. And then you have to put in minus a twelfth as the answer. And if you do that, you find that you get the right states of the fundamental string. And there are many different ways you can do the calculation, some which have nothing to do with, the, with this infinite sum. But they all give you the same answer, right? So it's real, I think. It's, I don't pretend to have an intuitive understanding of why, why it comes to that. Maybe Ramanujan did, someone like Ramanujan did, but I, I certainly don't. Obviously, it's completely counterintuitive to me. But for me, the thing that, the thing that nails it is those physics statements that, 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 you know, this is connected to physics. 
there are many different ways in which you can do these numbers and you just have to accept i think that infinity we we don't really experience infinite lives infinite you know, our lives do not really surround infinity you know infinity drove uh, george cantor some say to you know to insanity right it, it, it it's a completely different realm and the minute we start trying to apply our finite logic to an infinite world, things fall off, things go wrong. And I think that's, that's why it's upset people so much and why some people probably love it as well. You're someone who always seems up for the fight to me. <laughs> How have you found all the emails and criticisms to do with that video, but also just in general, you know, YouTube comments and people taking their poke at you from time to time, as, as they will for anyone who has an online presence. Are you at peace with it, or are you, do you, are you someone who feels this compulsion to answer back, or? I, th I think it depends. I think, I think where what we did gets misrepresented and taken out of context, which I think is a common thing that some people will do. They'll, they'll take some of the steps that we did, and then slightly sort of try to apply them in a different context or without that map to analytic continuation, which we never talked about in the video, but it was always there in the background. You've written a blog about it too, which, uh -huh. which I will link to. Yeah, so they'll slight, ever so slightly take out of context and then get nonsensical results. And we're like, yeah, mate, I know. I know this, right? And maybe we should have been clearer about all this in the video, perhaps. Maybe that, maybe that was what, what, what we didn't do, right? That, that's the, those are the ones that bug me because they're taking us slightly out of context. And there's a particular video which does this. But, you know, for most part, I mean, I would say mostly you get positive reactions. People, people often saw it as a gateway to, I think that video has been a gateway for lots of people into maths and, 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 and physics. And I think that ultimately is the most important thing. And, you know, it's certainly not fake news. So it's, uh, you know, I'll stand by that result. It's, it's something that I think is, you can use, if you want to say that the sum of the natural numbers is, you know, is it equivalent to minus a 12th or is it equal to minus a 12th? Well, do you know what? This is semantics now, isn't it? Let's just say it's equal. You've written a book. Yeah. How did that come about? I mean, I've always wanted to write, write a popular science book. It's always been something that's, that's been on my radar basically ever since I've you know, started becoming a professional uh, scientist. I, I don't even remember a couple of years, a few years ago, I had a, I had a friend who, who was poorly with, with cancer. He, he didn't make it in the end, but we were raising money. And obviously, you know, I think, I think you helped me as well in, in that respect. We we're trying to raise money for treatment for him. And one of the things I did is I went around, started giving the guy like a lecture course on, on like lectures, like talks on- To raise money for him. To raise money, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, people could donate on the way in. And, we, and, we, and you know, we did really well. We got a couple of grand out of that. And the theme of that talk, it was, it was about numbers and like sort of, a lot of things like Graham's number and, and Google Plex and those sort of things we've, we've made videos about, but also a bit more than that. It really sort of came together in a really nice sort of talk. And I realized as, when I was giving these talks that it would actually turn into a pretty cool book. So I thought, well, this could, this could actually, you know, you could, this could grow into a book, this, this, this thing. And it was all about that. It was about that sort of connection between extreme numbers and extreme physics, you know, like I'm, the Graham's number is the classic example, right? A crazy big number with this, New, you know, you have to think in a completely different way to sort of, to even describe it, right? You know, this all our own notation and all that. But at the same time, we talk about your head collapsing into a black hole, which is the physics of black holes and the physics of entropy and the physics of, you know, the holographic principle, all these cool, extreme cutting edge ideas. And I realized you could bring these two together in a really, really exciting way. But then I was approached by, by somebody about writing a book and, uh, and I thought, well, yeah, actually I've got this, this I've been thinking about. What's the book called and what will I find in it then? So it's, it's called Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them. What will you find in it? Well, it's, it's basically a list of numbers, a bunch of numbers, not numbers like Graham's number, tree three. It's broken up into three parts. You've got your big numbers, little numbers, and then infinity. And in the big number section where you obviously you find stuff like Graham's number, there I explore the, the, the idea of, of the holographic principle and, and the sort of physics of black holes. So this is the idea that that one of the dimensions that we see around us could, could well be a fake, that there's actually, we're tricked into thinking it exists because of gravity. So that, you know, you could think about, so you know, the physics of a, of a gravitational world in three dimensions actually can be just as well described without gravity in two dimensions. So it's like there's an illusion around us. These sorts of ideas underpin a lot of the statements that we made about your head collapsing into a black hole, you know, things like that, you know, when we talked about Graham's number. So you sort of put these things together, these ideas of these big numbers, but then you explore all loads of concepts like, like the physics of black holes, like the, the physics of information theory, the idea that 
the gravity is, is this fake that it tricks you into thinking there's extra dimension, there's a dimension there when it's not there at all. And all these really deep concepts. And then, then we move on to, onto the little numbers. And there I'm talking about things like the mystery of our, of our unexpected universe, like the small numbers that describe I don't know, like, like the, we, we talked about the universe is, is expanding and it's accelerating, but it's accelerating very slowly. And, you know, there's a small number which describes how unexpected that is. And, you know, we, the universe should be, just, should be accelerating like crazy. There should be this vacuum, the energy of the vacuum of space itself should be kicking the universe like crazy, so much so that it should have been torn into oblivion, like, you know, within a moment of being created. But that didn't happen. It's actually going very gently. And there's a kind of a ratio which describes that, which is the ratio of what we actually see versus what we expect. And it's 10 to the minus 120. And it just shows how unexpected, how finely tuned our universe is. So talk about these ideas about the Higgs uh, boson and, and, and that sort of thing in the, in the middle part of the book. And then I finish up with, with infinity and a theory of everything. You've written lots of papers in your time. You teach students, lectures, tutorials, all these different things. How was writing a book different to these other things you've done before? I think the, the, the best preparation for writing the book was, was, was number file, doing number file videos actually, because there when you're preparing for those, you're always trying to think of new ways to describe something in a fun and exciting way. And so, so that get, you put that kind of headset on, if you like. I mean, I don't know, I've always liked sort of just, just being dramatic. And, you know, in my lectures, I sort of throw pens around and jump off things and I do all sorts like that, right? And it, I kind of just did that to some extent, but in written form. <laughs> so it's Tony, a lot of uh, physicists and mathematicians I know who have other passions like music or art or things, sometimes they're able to draw inspiration from those passions to inform their work or in, in some way. Can you do that with being a Liverpool football fan? Can you ever be sitting in the cop watching a game and suddenly have some new insight into how maybe the universe works open up before you? That's never happened. That's never, I think I'm too much in the zone, to be honest. That's, right. that's never happened. I can imagine someone like Phil, you know, with his, with his, you know, with his guitar and all that, right? And uh, I'll tell you what is true. Obviously, you know, living in Nottingham and driving to, to the match, it's a couple of hours to Liverpool. And, and it, you get, if you're on your own, it's sort of, Got, sometimes you've got thinking time, particularly if you're going in the mid, in midweek. So that, that's kind of a, a quiet thinking time that you have uh, sometimes. Right. The, the, so I'd say in that respect, but nah, not in... Not the game. Well, once I'm at the game, nah, you're in the zone, aren't you? It's too intense. Right. Um, I'm getting a little bit nervous, not about the game, but about what you're going to be like. <laughs> well, it'll be fine, Brady. We're just going to... It's only if we... I mean, if we get beat, uh, it might be quite... Uh, <laughs> right. But, but I don't think we're going to lose, are we? I don't know. I don't know. I am a Liverpool fan too, but I'm not, I'm not at your level. We've been talking about coming to a game together for seven or eight years now. Yeah. It took us a while. It took you trying to sell a book for you to finally get me a ticket. To be honest, that's not fair, Billy. I did have you a ticket for another game, didn't I? Wasn't I? I can't remember. When was that? Was, there was Maybe. one age ago and then we couldn't go. Maybe, Maybe it was a pandemic hit one. I can't remember now. I don't know. Anyway, we're doing it now. Gomez. Diogo shot a goal! <laughs> to ease the tension late on. And he does it absolutely wonderfully well. What was the score? 2-0. Uh, uh, right at the top of the league. <laughs> Shots all about. You said it was going to be 4-0? Yeah, well, I'll, take, I'll just take us mid top of the league. That'll do me. That's sad. So, all good. All good, yeah. Enjoy it? Did you enjoy the game? Was yeah, it? well, it wasn't a great game, but, you know, it was, it was... It's the result that matters at this stage of the season. We're at the business end now, aren't we? So, that's all that counts. 
you predicted 4 0. Yeah. It was 2 0 to Liverpool. Yeah, I still won that, didn't we? Once the book's all done and become a bestseller and made you a millionaire, <laughs> what's next for you work wise? What's your holy grail? What would make you think that was it? You know, I did it. I did the thing I wanted to do. The thing I would like is, is to solve something called the cosmological constant problem. That's kind of the, the problem I've been working on most of my career. How do you reconcile spending half your time thinking about the universe being torn to pieces and what makes the universe work, and the other half thinking about Liverpool 2, Wat <laughs> Watford nil? How, how do I reconcile it? Well, it's just, you know... Um... They seem... One seems so important and one seems so trivial and... You talk about Liverpool being Watford being important, actually. <laughs> They're just different parts of your brain, I think, right? Just that, you know, one is sort of your relaxed time, and the other, but the other one I also enjoy thinking you know, thinking about the cosmological constant. It's, it's actually, I, I really enjoy thinking about that. That's, that's uh, fun to think about. They're just things that I enjoy doing, thinking about both. They don't have to be the same thing. I'm sure there's things that you enjoy which are disparate, that, uh, you know, it's, it's, we can like different things, and it's okay. Um, and I think that's it, really. It's just two different things that, that I enjoy doing. I also like enjoy watching watching The Office, right? That's another thing, right? <laughs> it's just completely different, yeah. But do you ever sit there amongst, you know, 50,000 sports fans at Anfield and think, oh, I wish more of these people cared about physics and mathematics and cosmological constant? Do you think it's a shame everyone there is not into it like you, or you're quite happy with that? Yes, and no. I mean, a bit. A, a bit. I mean, I think... Obviously, the more people are engaged with science in general, it doesn't have to be about the cosmological constant, it could be about any, any science, right, is, is always a good thing for society. I think that's, that's you know, you, you, if you've got a, a society that cares about science, then, then, then that, that's going to be a society which is probably going to make good choices, I think. But, of course, not everybody has to like it. You know, there's other really important things. Those people, I'm sure, they'll, some of them will, will love literature, they'll love films, there'll, there'll be many things that those people will love, and that's okay, we all come together because we love football in that particular moment, but there's going to be a whole variety of things that people are into there, and that's just what makes humans humans, right? That Not everybody can like the same stuff, and that's, that's fine. Does physics or mathematics ever give you the exhilaration or the thrill that football gives you? Like the other end of the spectrum? Oh, that's a good question. I think it, it can. It has its moments. I mean, you know, when you sort of come up with a, like a, a cool result or something, and you, you, everything comes together in your calculation, and then you sort of think, wow, that's cool. And then you sort of go home and it's, it's sort of like, you're kind of walking on air a little bit when you're doing that. Now, of course, but I, I, what I've learned is that, you know, whenever that happens, I, I, I don't say anything. Like I used to sort of tell my wife and stuff, and I thought, but now I've learned not to, because whenever, I'm sure that whenever I tell her, then I'll go back the next day and spot an error in what I was doing and it all goes wrong and falls apart, right? So, you know, I get a bit superstitious like that. But um, yeah, I mean, actually, you know, one of the places you really get a kick, I think, is, is giving um, public talks. I think that's probably the, the instant where you get the, that moment where you're sort of delivering this, this material that you're, you're really excited about. It's really cool. It's fun. You're delivering it in a deliberately fun way as well. You know, it's, you're trying to get the audience interested and excited. And, and, um, and then you, you, see, you, know, you see that happening. I think that's what it probably a really... Uh, big thrill you can get from You mentioned that sometimes you might share a breakthrough or an exciting moment to do with your work with your wife. I know your wife's very accomplished with numbers, but she's not a mathematician or a physicist, is she? No. How much are you able to communicate the depths of your work with her? Because I certainly don't understand the depths of your work when you go deep. How deep can you go, you know, at the dinner table? Yeah, you don't really. Not. I mean, so there was a... A thing recently about black hole information problem being, you know, it was in the news. She actually seen it on the news before I'd even seen it, and, and I was like, she goes, "Oh, what's that then?" So I started to explain it to her, and then she starts to take the Mickey a little bit, and like, you know, gets the kids involved and said, "This is this is the sort of stuff that Daddy's thinking about all day." And uh, um, yeah, to be honest, she's not really into science. I mean, she she she's read my book, she proofread it, but but science is, isn't isn't really her thing. I don't think. And you have two quite young children. Can they comprehend at all what Daddy does? They just again take the mick. Um, just I, I mean, I'm just I'm just sort of the lowest of the low in our house, right? So, you know, you know, they're smart kids, but um, yeah, mostly they just think that I'm a bit nuts and a bit weird. And um, yeah, that, that's how it is. They call me Gilderoy now. That's their latest thing. 
<laughs> what, from <laughs> Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why Gilderoy? Because he wrote a book, didn't he? That's why. So that's that's okay. So that's the little thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you'd like to check out Tony's book, that title again was Fantastic Numbers and Where to Find Them. Tony's full name and the one on the book is actually Antonio Padilla, in case you're searching for it, but I'll include order links in the usual notes for the show. I'll also link to some of Tony's number file videos, of course, plus anything else that might be useful. Our thanks to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California, for its support of number file, and to G Research for supporting this episode. I'm Brady Harron. And you've been listening to the Number File Podcast. <laughs>